Hello everyone and welcome to today's learning session, Developing Allometric Equations for Red MRV, a Practical Guide, organized by World Wildlife Fund's Forest and Climate Program. Thanks for taking the time to join us. My name is Breen Burns and I'm a manager for Red Learning and Communication. Our presenter today is Rosa C. Goodman, an independent consultant working in forest conservation and sustainable management with a particular focus on the tropics. So before we begin, I'd like to share a few logistical tips and reminders. Today's presentation is being recorded and you can access the recording within a few days on our YouTube channel. To find the recording, simply go to youtube.com and search for WWF Forest and Climate or go to panda.org slash forest climate and look for the red learning section. You will also receive an email after this webinar with a link to another place where you can find a recording. So there are many ways to find the recording. There are two audio options. You can listen via your computer speakers or dial in through the number that was provided in your registration email. It is important to note that if you experience audio difficulties while listening via your computer, this can be caused by having too many internet windows open. So please feel free to close some of them and that usually solves the problem or you can always join by phone. If you're having any technical troubles, please send me or Jenny Guzman a message via the chat area, and if possible, we will try to get it sorted out. Questions are certainly welcome. Please submit your questions for Rosa through the toolbar on your screen, and we will answer as many as possible during our allotted time. After the webinar, you'll receive a link to the place on redcommunity.org where you can access a PDF copy of this presentation and, as I mentioned, a link to the recording of the session. So thanks again for joining us, and with that, we'll get started. And I will turn it over to Rosa. Rosa, go ahead, please. Hi. Um, yes, my name is Rosa Goodman, and I recently finished my PhD at the University of Leeds. And a lot of this work is from my my thesis. Um, <clears throat> a lot, sorry, a lot of this presentation is based on my thesis work. Um, but in light, uh, as soon as we we posted this webinar, someone asked um, if this this presentation was still relevant because of the the new Shaw 2004 equations um, just com coming out in global change biology. And so I really adjusted the webinar quite a lot to make it so that it's still relevant and. Um, I've tried to, um, <clears throat> so yeah, I've tried to make it a lot more broadly relevant because more people use existing equations and need to evaluate those um, than actually make their own equations. So in that whole process, I must say I've made it a little bit less of a practical guide, but hopefully it's more overall useful. Um, <clears throat> so what I, uh, I what I was asked to do is um, look at these for these questions and. Um, so why do we need another set of allometric equations? And I've sort of changed that to when do we need a new set. And then I get into the details of sampling methods and data processing model development and selection. And then I use my example from, uh, to show the increase in accuracy and impact on regional estimates. And then I have more general discussions about how to evaluate pantropical models. And um, I make recommendations from the, the lessons I've learned over the last several years. Um, all right, Breen, can you show the next slide? All right, so to start out, um, we have what is allometry. So um, it's been defined as the study of correlations between the dimensions of different traits of an organism. And apparently Leonardo da Vinci long ago said that all branches of trees at every stage of their height united together are equal to the thickness of the the trunk below them. So that's really bringing in the importance of diameter in allometry and tree mass. And this was uh, put in more scientific terms with the pipe model that related leaf area to the width of the pipe by the stem or branch serving as both vascular tissues and mechanical support. So again, diameter is a really important parameter. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, the allometric scaling laws were developed by West et al relating a biological variable to body mass in a general formula. And the important thing is that that's an exponential relationship. Next slide. So back to this question, why do we need another set of allometric equations? 
Well, in general, we can say that the estimates vary greatly between equations, so especially as tree size increases. Um, and one reason for this is that most models have been developed with very few or even no data from very large trees. And historically, there's also been quite poor sampling across geographic and environmental space. So then that begs the question of uh, which one do we use and, um, and, and how accurate are they? And the answer is that it depends on the situation, so largely the location and the data available. But I'll show you how to evaluate. So if we look at this um, figure, I've compiled several amalgamatic equations that, so pantropical ones, so just a second. Um, so several pantropical equations um, using just diameter or diameter and wood density where, uh, with a fixed wood density. And all of these should be fairly applicable to the southwestern Amazon where I worked. So if you just look at the extreme example of a tree at 200 centimeters, you can see that some equations, they could be as low as um, 13 tons. You can see that with the Chambers equations, the trees hardly um, <clears throat> increase in biomass. Uh, well, the predictions don't increase in biomass after about 120 centimeters. With the Shaw of 2005 moist, we'd get 66 tons. Next. Yeah, with the West theoretical model, we got 140 tons. And then with Feldposh, um, 61 tons. So basically, there's a giant range there. And so one reason for this um, could be the, the general lack of large trees in the database. So in Shab 2005, only 14 trees um, had diameter greater than 100 centimeters. The Feldposh database, I don't have access to, but at least eight. And you can see that the maximum tree size increased. So he did add some new trees um, in the updated Shav. Um, equations, a lot more trees, over 4,000 with 94 um, greater than 100 centimeters dBH. So that leaves us with, before we had less than 1% of trees with diameter greater than 100, and now we have 2.3, which is still quite small. And so why is this a problem? Because um, there's still a really high uncertainty for large trees. So you can see um, these are two examples of um, how large trees can sort of change the shape of the resulting model. And you can see that in the, on the left, in a small data set, there was one tree with um, biomass or with a diameter over 100 centimeters. And you get this um, exponential relationship. Whereas if that one tree had been um, <clears throat> a different, much, much smaller or weighed less, then you'd get um, a different relationship there. And the same with the, the Chambers equations. He didn't. He only had. Oh, yeah. He only had one tree greater than 100 centimeters, and so they sort of leveled off at that point. Whereas if he had had another tree, a larger tree, it may have changed the shape of the relationship. And that shows how um, <clears throat> the lack of big trees can really determine the relationship that you find in an allometric equation. So looking at the unrepresented geographies, this is a map from Shav 2005. And you can see that there is no data from the entire um, continent of Africa. And there's also a pretty giant gap in the southwestern Amazon there. So if you go to the next. Yes, this is uh, where I worked in the southwestern Amazon. You can see that there are basically there are no more data around there. Um, but in the new, um, yes, in the new Shav paper, you can see that there are a lot more data, um, especially so from all around the Amazon and Asia, and then um, a lot more from Africa. All right, so going back to the question of why would we need another set of allometric equations, taking the example of the southwestern Amazon, there are several factors that vary across the basin including um, species composition, wood density, maximum tree height and height diameter relationships, and even crown size. So all this implies that the allometric relationships between measurable variables and total above ground biomass is also going to vary across the Amazon. So if we look at this paper, it's, um, you can see sort of contrasting trends here. Uh, it's quite it's fairly well known that trees are shortest in the southwest, and they sort of increase going up to the northeast, whereas in a sort of in a perpendicular angle, um, the, 
the crown sizes are short in the northwest and sort of increase towards the south where it gets the dark green band in this paper. So some recent developments in the southwestern Amazon biomass estimates is that some studies have begun to account for this allometric, um, or, yeah, this, this allometric variation across the Amazon by considering tree height um, and wood density. So in the case of the southwestern Amazon, lower tree height and lower wood density. So just accounting for these two variables, um, it's resulted in a downgrade of forest biomass estimates by 6 to even 16 percent in this part of the Amazon, which has really giant implications for carbon accounting, but it hasn't been tested on directly measured biomass data in the southwestern Amazon, and they haven't considered variation in crown mass. So my theory and why um, the impetus for me to make new allometric equations is that um, pantropical equations, including height, tend to underestimate the biomass of trees in the lower statured forests of the southwestern Amazon because large crowns at least partially compensate for their shorter stems. So by that I mean yes, they have large crowns, but they also have large stems. So I'm saying that instead of comparing those first two sticks, we look at the, um, the whole tree, including the crown. So the sample selection, um, I've developed this myself um, with a pretty thorough literature literature review and um, trying to do the best job out there. So the goal um, that I recommend is to have a roughly equal number of trees in each diameter size class. I used 20 centimeters, but you could use 10 or, or something else. And then the real crux of my sampling scheme is to use average wood density to make, um, to get the average wood density of the sample about equal to that of the forest in each diameter size class. And then we need to, of course, within that framework, be unbiased, um, uh, <laughs> excuse me, get an unbiased uh, sample of the forest. So we basically ignore um, structural damage, stem form, and we don't just collect um, commercial species above a certain diameter. So my method of doing this was, um, luckily I had an exploratory survey from a company. Um, and they list uh, the name and diameter of every tree over 10 centimeters in, in their transects. So what I did is uh, I first matched the common name with scientific names and then assigned a wood density value from the Global Wood Density Database. Um, and then <coughs> I conducted a pre-harvest inventory where I measured a lot more trees than I could weigh so that I could have some options. So with that, um, I measured diameter at breast height so D, um, and total height and crown radius. So this is an example of my spreadsheet. Um, so you can see that in the, the first example, if I take all the, the mean wood density of all the trees in the exploratory survey, I would get a mean wood density of 0.56. But since I want eight samples in that size class, um, if you go to the next, yeah, if we look at, um, the eight most common species, the wood density would be a bit too high. So then I had to come up with this suggested sample, um, which in this case it wasn't perfect, but it's pretty close. And you'll see that I used a lot of the um, of the of the eight most oh, yeah a lot of the most common species, um, but not entirely. If I used the eight most common species from every size class, I would uh, not really capture the biodiversity of the forest. So this was a quite um, difficult process, and um, especially with the larger size classes. For example, if the, the pre-harvest inventory, if I estimated um, a, a diameter of 92 centimeters above buttresses, and then I cut it down and it was 88 centimeters, then it changed size class or sometimes we found that it was a different species once we had the leaves and we could identify. So it was quite a dynamic process with a lot of lateral flow. So this is where the, the pre-harvest inventory came in. It just gave me more options to work with. Okay, so the post-harvest methods are quite simple, um, technically. <laughs> um, so first of all, you have to fell the tree, and then you remeasure everything, so the height and the diameter. Um, and then at commercial height if you want. And then you need to separate and weigh the fresh mass. 
So um, for the small branches and leaves, um, I just left the I just left the leaves that were still attached to the small branches because um, they were just far too many leaves to separate. And then large branches would be everything over 10 centimeters. The non-commercial bowl and the stump. Um, can you squick? Yes, I used a 250 kilogram scale to weigh those in the field, whereas the commercial bowl I left intact and then skid it to the road um, and weighed it with a six ton scale. So then it's vitally important that you collect wood samples. Um, yeah, wood, wood samples from each tree part. And these need to be measured um, immediately um, from fresh cuts only in the field. And then um, it's better, the sooner the better um, for volume. Um, <clears throat> but I didn't have access to a high quality laboratory in the field, so I had to wait for a little bit. And then also collect herbarium samples for the species identification. So there's an alternative method to this, which is probably a lot easier. Um, basically, just measure the volume of the, the trunk and branches, um, estimate the hollow areas, measure height, um, length, width of the buttresses. But in my, I would recommend that, um, to weigh any irregular sections and the buttresses directly, or basically just any of the tricky parts. It's um, <clears throat> any, anything that would be um, have quite a high uncertainty on the volume estimate, I would recommend measuring directly. All right, so to show you how this looks, this is an example of a 132 centimeter tree. So not enormous, and certainly not the biggest we did, but a good example of how the fieldwork looks. Just scroll through these. That's how it fell. That's the mess of branches. This is us cutting branches up making piles, you can see the wall of small trees, and lifting them and weighing with the small scale, and then using gravity to uh, transport some branches. And there we are bucking, and there we are, my poor friend covered in bees because they like salt and we had lots of it. So moving on to the weighing the stems, you can see here's the, the six ton scale is actually quite small, but you need some giant hooks to go with it. And then, yeah, so then we tie a cable, um, we tied a cable around a forklift, and then we, we wrapped up the stem in, some, in, in more cable, and then you lift. Ah. Okay, <laughs> and that's what that looks like. Okay, so the, the lab work, um, again, so I used uh, volume, uh, measured volume by water displacement, the wood samples and then uh, left the wood samples out um, to air dry while, uh, before I could get to a lab, and then stuck them in oven and dry them just above 100 degrees until constant mass, and then you weigh those to get the dry mass. And um, I'll say, I'll issue a warning from personal experience. These steps are small but incredibly important and can be really a giant source of air. So first of all, you have natural variation in moisture content and wood density within a tree, so you really need to get enough samples, even along the stem, multiple samples. Um, and then also, small measurement errors can make a big difference when you're scaling up, so it's really important to have a big enough piece of wood that you can measure quite reliably. And then there's also quite a risk of losing samples from mold, them falling apart, um, bark falling off, or you can't read the number because it seeped in to really moist wood or it molded or there are any number of things. So I, I just recommend taking this step very seriously and to have backups. So then um, the data preparation is quite simple. So converting the actual raw data to directly measured biomass data. Um, first of all, you calculate the moisture content and wood density. Um, but the important part is that you do that by tree part. So You'd have the stem, maybe even multiple, you know, the lower stem, upper stem, the large branches, the small branches. And then you can either calculate the dry mass by fresh mass times 1 minus the moisture content, or if you've done it by volume, then you multiply by wood density. And again, you do that by tree part. So then moving on to the model development. Um, when we're thinking about modeling approaches, I encourage people to um, think about the biological significance of each model form. So for example, the 
exponential relationship between um, <clears throat> uh, biomass and diameter uh, should, uh, is consistent with allometric theory. If you have the uh, compound variable diameter squared height, then that implies a cylinder, and then you multiply by wood density and you get the mass of that cylinder. And then there's a, there's a question of whether it's better to use one compound variable, so uh, diameter squared height times wood density, versus having the, the three separate variables. And then this is sort of a, a tedious point I'm not sure many people notice, but some papers constrain coefficients which turn into exponents to one, and um, I just want to mention that this is an assumption and it um, removes the ability to, to fit the data statistically. So in this case, you can see that in the first example, you have plus C times natural log wood density. And in the other example, um, in the next equation, it, that C has been removed. So basically, you're assuming that C equals one. And, and biologically, that means that you're saying that wood density has no other role than converting volume to mass. So you're um, taking out the, the possibility that there's any other relationship to allometry. So I'm generally not a fan of that. But um, I also issue a warning that you should be careful, careful with statistical fits. For example, this um, diameter, diameter cubed, um, squared diameter cubed model, it may fit the data, but it really doesn't have a direct biological significance. So then another big question is whether to um, use linear regression on log transform data or nonlinear regression on, on the original data. So transformation is generally used to satisfy the assumptions of linear regression. So we have take the natural log of both sides um, for the, the linear regression, or we can just keep the exponential relationship in nonlinear regression. So criticisms of transforming data be that estimates outside the range of observations um, often yield very serious errors. Um, and even small errors on the log scale translate into very large errors on the original scale, or they can in the case of large trees. Um, so um, it also reduces the influence of large trees. And then finally, back transforming the data can underestimate biomass, but then applying correction factors can lead to overestimates. Um, yes, OK. So, um, so I looked into this in quite a lot of detail, and I found out that the appropriateness of, of, the, of linear versus nonlinear modeling depends on the error structure. So with an additive error structure, the variation is homogeneous, whereas a multiplicative error structure, the, the variation increases as the explanatory variable increases, which is generally the case for biomass data. At least with, with tree biomass data, that's always going to be the case. So you can see the example here with nonlinear you have your model and then you add error, whereas, um, sorry, with the nonlinear, with the linear, you're adding error on the log scale, but then that transfer um, translates into multiplying by the exponent of error. So that would be accounting for the multiplicative error structure. So I'll point out that the um, additive error is assumed in R, but not in all programs. And if we just look at the um, this graph here as an example, um, you can see that the this is this is just the data with multiplicative error structure, and you can see that both on the the original scale on the left and on the log scale on the right, the blue line, the the linear regression, just fits the data a lot better, and the red line, the nonlinear regression, is going to be quite inappropriate there. So, in conclusion, um, the additive errors violate allometric theory and prefer. Ooh, and perform um, worse than log transformed linear models, whereas um, so but linear models with multiplicative error may be marginally better in some cases, but log transformed linear models are better in others. So it's really quite a toss up, and in the end, I just chose to go with the the log transformed linear regression. So. Assuming that we're using linear regression, um, we start with our x variables, and then of course we have to transform those. And the same goes with the y variable. And usually we use a um, total above ground dry mass, but um, you could also use below ground if you have that data. So the first thing you always need to do with regression is to check for multicollinearity between variables. And I use the threshold of if they're more correlated than 0.95, then you can't include the same variables in 
in in the model. Um, but this generally isn't going to be the case with um, with uh, two to four variables. So we always use diameter wood density, sometimes height, and then very very rarely crown radius. So I do recommend it. So second, um, we can build models with either forward or backward selection. Um, and again, since we have so few data, it's uh, not particularly important whether you um, use which, which one you use to reach a minimum adequate model with um, all, where all uh, variables are significant. But you can um, play around with uh, using both and see if you reach the same minimum adequate model. So with forward selection, you add variables until they're no longer significant. And backward selection, you remove those. And for that, um, I use the drop term function in R. And that can be more of an issue if you decide to use the, the square, um, the quadratic and, and cubic functions of diameter, for example. Um, <clears throat> so finally, you need to test your assumptions of linear regression. So homogeneous variance and linearity, you can test by plotting the residual values with the nodules. You can look at QQ plots and then also use an actual um, test. I use the Anderson-Darling test. All right. So to evaluate models, the first thing that you do is to evaluate the, the log transformed um, models, so outputs from R or SAS or whatever program you use. <clears throat> so this is evaluating the models um, uh, on the data upon which they were built. So of course, R squared, you want higher the residual standard error and AIC, you want to be lower. So in lieu of AIC, you could use other um, model selection or information criteria. Um, and and the, the point of these is to penalize, penalize models with more variables, but um, I'll point out that they can't detect compound variables. So comparing, so they would penalize a model with diameter and wood density as separate uh, variables more than they would penalize a model with one compound variable, diameter squared height times wood density, for example. <clears throat> and then another really important point, which I didn't find in the, the tree biomass data, but with the palm biomass data, um, I did. And it's the, the problem is that none of these variables are always comparable between models. For example, the R squared value can be different if you um, have removed the intercept or not. The RSC and AIC aren't comparable between models built on the log scale on, on log transform data and um, and non-transform data. So it's really not quite as straightforward as you'd like it to be. But in this case, all data were built on the um, on the log scale, and this first model, um, Roman numeral 1.1, is clearly the best by all selection criteria. Okay, so then I also think that it's really important to evaluate predictions on the original scale. So the first thing you need to do, so um, looking at prediction errors on the original scale, is remember to apply a correction factor to back transform data. And there are actually alternatives to um, this Baskerville model that I have recently discovered. Um, <clears throat> so then next you calculate your error, so just the predicted value minus observed value. And I prefer that method so that positive values are overestimates and negative values are underestimates. And then relative error is just the, the error as a percentage of the observed value. And this um, subset, that can be considered the bias um, by, I think Shav calls that bias. Um, so the standard deviation of relative errors is a good measure of overall predictability. But I also think it's quite important to look at the absolute error because if you're looking at stand level biomass, the error is going to be the cumulative value, so not just relative um, to the size of the tree. So in that um, regard, I looked at mean error and mean percent error and the sum of errors. And then finally, I calculated the R-square value on the original scale. So if we look at how what happens here, you can see, first of all, that um, <clears throat> the, the model selection is not so straightforward. Um, you can see the, um, and then the other thing I want to point out is the, the, the relative error is used to examine bias, but I would also say that the, the mean error of, on 
you know, absolute error is also quite an, a good indicator of bias. And in this case, the, the model with only diameter is actually the least biased. But um, in that sense, on, on total error, but on relative error, is quite, quite biased. Um, but R squared value is very low. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> um, yes. OK, so comparing um, the regional estimates, um, or sorry, my, my regional model predictions with previously published models, I, if you look at this table, I, I use the, the mean for all models with only diameter, or only diameter with density. And um, so the mean of all previously published models I evaluated compared to mine. And you can see that in every case, um, the, the mean and sum of errors went down, the R squared value went up, and the relative errors went down. So in this case, the local models were always an improvement. Another thing that I noticed was that the estimates from my equations were much more stable than the range of estimates derived from published models. And even more interesting, even within the same data set, say all the Alvarez equations or all the Shav equations, um, the, the estimates could vary quite a lot when you use different parameters. And I'm not sure, but I, um, I would like to think that that's because of the, um, the quite robust um, sampling method I had. So then the, the final point, oh, sorry, can you go back a second? The final point I'll make is that the, um, the models with crown radius were really far better than all the others on all accounts. All right. So then I have a, a few critical discussions. So in this, this question of pantropical versus local models, um, uh, the pros for the, the pantropical mainly that you have more trees. The cons is that um, it may ignore allometric differences, and all data are combined. So even when a sampling bias is stated in the original work, like if they only um, used commercial species over 50 centimeters diameter, um, even if those are stated in the original work, biomass data tends to be so precious that it's all included in the pantropical data sets. So whereas with local models, hopefully they'll capture regional allometry. And in my assessment, I think that height estimates or measures might not be necessary. The con, you have a smaller sample size. But in um, the Shav 2014 data set, he, um, he evaluated the, the local versus pantropical estimates. And usually, the, the local models perform better. So in this case, looking at bias and um, uh, coefficient of variation between the pantropical and local models, you can see that um, to the right or below the, the dashed one-to-one -one line, the local model performs better, which is most of the most of it, most of the data, but not not at every site. So the next critical discussion is about including height. So height um, can be measured with a clinometer or laser hypsometer, or there might be new equipment, um, or it can be estimated from diameter using for example, a regional height diameter equation, or from diameter and an environmental parameter as the, the new Shav data, data set does. So a pro of including height is that overall, it generally improves estimates um, in pantropical models. The cons that I've identified are that the measurements are difficult and time consuming and often inaccurate um, if you measure them directly, whereas if you estimate height from diameter, that's an extra step with an extra source of error. So within one local study, which happened to be mine, um, I found that it was better to estimate um, biomass with just diameter and wood density than from diameter, wood density, and height, where height was estimated by a locally developed height diameter model. So basically, I think it's just because of that extra step of error. Um, and then a final thing is that there have been different results between two pantropical analyses of um, height diameter relationships that just makes me a little bit dubious of including those. And then again, in the, the Shav paper, he's comparing models with and without height. And in this case, to the left or above the one-to-one -one line, um, the model with height is better. So again, that's most, but not all of them. All right, and then finally, looking at my data. Um, comparing previously published models with and without height. 
I divided my data into um, size classes, small, medium, and large, so 10 to 50, 50 to 90, and then large is over 90 centimeters. And you can see that looking at the, the middle and um, the Feldposch and, and Shav equations, the pantropical models, um, the model in gray without height slightly overestimates um, tree biomass for all size classes. Whereas the model with height, it does improve estimates for the small and medium trees. You know, they're much closer to zero, the, the errors. This is um, mean error by size class. Whereas with the large trees, it's, they just really underestimate the biomass when you include height. And then an update um, in the 2004, model four, the estimates were very similar, but actually even lower for very large trees. All right, so continuing this discussion on large trees, the pantropical models tend to underestimate the biomass of very large trees. And including height doesn't improve estimates for large trees. Including height improved estimates overall for the whole database because there's so many small and medium-sized trees, but it doesn't help for the large trees. So what I found is that including crown radius does improve the estimates for large trees. And in fact, it explains more variation than um, height. So if we look at, um, <clears throat> here's a, a figure from the new Shav paper, and you can see that he's comparing error to the, the natural log of biomass. And you can see that small trees are overestimated by quite a bit. Medium-sized trees are overestimated slightly. And then over 18 tons about, um, trees are, are quite underestimated. And 18 tons isn't even a very big tree, so I can, I, I can only imagine that, that um, just continues to underestimate very large trees. So, but then if you look at, um, this is a figure from my paper looking at the improvements in above ground biomass estimates in comparable models with and without crown radius. Um, so the ones, uh, so above the line is um, an improvement in the model, whether that's more or less. And you can see that over 90 centimeters, the, the models with crown radius really improves um, individual tree biomass by quite a lot. And then <laughs> one final, uh, well, I guess it is an absolute final, but um, more room for improvement is looking at arborescent palms or palm trees, and just to say that they're very different from dicot trees. For one, they have no branches, they have quite a poor relationship between height and diameter, and they have very different internal properties. So if we look at the um, the figures here, you can see the, the first on the left, we have stem height versus diameter. There's very little relationship. Biomass versus diameter, there actually is sort of a, an exponential relationship overall. And then biomass versus stem height, you can see that the different species have quite a strong uh, relationship there. And then um, the really interesting thing is to look at um, what happens when we estimate palm biomass with pantropical um, dicot tree models, which is how we currently do it. And if we look at the error compared to diameter, the diameter increases whether it's more or less. Um, uh, but if the, the really interesting thing here is to look at the error um, compared to stem height. And you can see that there's a, this sort of threshold around 14 meters, where um, below, below 14 meters stem height, the dicot models overestimate biomass, whereas below that, um, sorry, higher than um, 14 or 15 meters stem height, the, the dicot models actually underestimate palm biomass. So in conclusion, well, the, uh, the reason for this is that um, palm trees can be much taller than dicots at very small diameters. So in the end, um, palm biomass is generally underestimated in mature forests because trees are taller than this threshold of 14 or 15 meters. So in the example of Madre de Dios, the density was underestimated by 14 to 40 um, percent, actually. So in conclusion, just um, palm, palm should not be estimated with dicot models, and stem height is the most important predictor variable for them. But um, in lieu of stem height, the family level models without stem height estimate plot level biomass pretty well, surprisingly well, in fact. All right.
So if we take all these new models for trees and palms and apply them to, um, uh, to the southwestern Amazon, I use 53 lowland permanent plots from the rainfall network within the southwest Amazon moist forest terrestrial ecoregion. So I used my tree equations with just diameter and wood density because we don't have height or crown radius in every one of those plots. Um, and then the same with palm, just the family level models. And then I used uh, pantropical model estimates with and without um, height, where um, so the, in model two I used diameter and wood density and then height estimated with regional models. So if we just look at um, how this turns out, um, <clears throat> so looking at the just the, the the biomass density, the overall mean biomass density. Um, so my estimates compared to the pantropical estimates, you can see that for trees, my estimates are 10% less than those without height, the model one, but 9% more than those with height. Um, with palms, the, my my estimates are always more than the Dicot model estimates. So when we combine these together, tree and palm um, biomass is roughly in between the two pantropical models with and without height. All right, so then if we scale that up to the entire ecoregion, which is just less than three quarters of a million kilometers squared, you can see that above ground biomass estimates are 1.7 um, petagrams um, more than the the Feldposh 2 estimates, so that's the, the, recommend, the one he recommends with height. If we add below ground uh, biomass, that's 2.1 petagrams more. Um, and then if we look at the carbon stocks, that's one petagram or a billion tons more um, than estimated by, by the Feldposh 2 model, which is quite a globally significant value. It's about as much as it's emitted each year by tropical deforestation. All right, so to conclude, I have um, some, some general recommendations for choosing a biomass equation. So first, the, it's, it's important to note that the best predictability and the lowest bias don't always coincide. And in my analysis, the best model was not always logical. For example, the Shav 2005 tropical was better than moist, and I wouldn't have known that without weighing trees myself. Um, Local models are usually more reliable, but not always. Larger sample sizes are usually more reliable, but not always. So for example, I would value, if I had a large data set, three um, extra large trees more than 100 extra very small trees. So it's also important to remember that all these models are based on statistical fits. So it's important to check the input data, so the, the minimum and maximum diameter and distribution. Um, within that, and then also look for any sample biases. For example, if only commercial species were used greater than um, x centimeters, then the, the, um, that's going to translate into probably more dense wood and better form for the large trees than the average for the forest. And then also look at the location and, um, and, ge uh, and allometric trends across the geographic space, so height diameter relationships and crown size to look for. Also, there can be publication errors and um, correction factors. You need to be careful. Sometimes they're included and sometimes there's not, so you really just need to read the text. And then there's one more slide of recommendations. Um, so more variables is not always better. Um, I would be in, uh, especially careful about including height because um, poor measurements are quite common, and using um, height diameter models to estimate height introduces another source of error, and it's not always better than excluding height altogether. So also, best estimates, even from models with more variables, shouldn't be regarded as the true biomass or the baseline to which all other estimates are compared. In the case of my model, um, or my data, the, um, the Feldposh, the, the difference between the two Feldposh equations was about 16%, but it's not to say that the one without height was a 16% underestimate. Rather, the, the true biomass was sort of in, uh, in the middle there, in between those two estimates. Um, estimates for large trees are still quite poor, but including crown dimensions and architectures, quite promising. Um, the importance for large trees, 
really depends on your research site and um, objectives. I'm a bit obsessed with them, but not everyone is. So in lieu of developing new elementary equations, um, I would recommend weighing a few trees and testing them against existing models. And then one final slide of future directions. I'd say if we're going to collect any more biomass data, it'd be interesting to look at um, the use of terrestrial LIDAR to capture the volume of standing trees. And that could really be used to better um, represent uh, uh, different forest types across the tropics. And we could get a lot more big trees. Um, and then I cast my vote for including um, crown measurements, so crown dimensions and even architectural type. And then to answer this question of um, can crown dimensions account for variation not currently accounted for in pantropical allometric equations, and also um, if they can be used to um, improve large tree biomass estimates. So just one final um, plug, if there are any remote sensing people out there, um, some of my models could be used to estimate um, could estimate large tree biomass directly from crown area and height, which would avoid the uh, step of estimating diameter from height and then biomass from diameter. And although this would be limited to emergent trees, um, the large trees are really important drivers of overall forest biomass des uh, density, and they'll also be um, they'll, they'll be the first to be removed in selective logging. And so with that and scroll through my references, and I believe we'll take questions. Yes, thank you, Rosa. So we're going to scroll through this. I skip? There's two reference slides there. So there's the first <laughs> reference slide, and here's the second. And I'm sure people are curious about where they can get a copy of this presentation. And as you are thinking of your questions, rest assured that the presentation will be made available in PDF form on redcommunity.org, and as I mentioned at the beginning, you will receive a link in the follow-up email to the place on Red Community where you can find that. So at this point, we will open it up to questions for Rosa, and just make sure on your toolbar there are a couple of ways. We are looking for you to type your questions in, so there's also a raise your hand option, but don't use that. Please type in your specific question, and we will answer as many as we have time for with Rosa. So. As you're typing in your questions, I'm going to let this slide sit up there with some resources where you can find additional information. And to kick us off, Rosa, the first question we have is, do you really think we need any more biomass data and equations? All right. Um, OK, that's a good question. So I would say yes and no to that one. On the no front, I would say it's a lot of work, and it is quite a destructive process. And also the, the new Shaw equations changed very little, even though um, there was a lot more data and from new equations. And then um, also the, the science isn't lacking quite as much as the policy and action. But on the, on the yes side, I would say that it does make a huge difference. Um, in, in my small study area, I found one pedogram difference, um, so gigaton. Um, by using a local model versus a pantropical model, so it does make quite a difference. Um, and uh, site-specific biomass estimates are quite important when you're looking at deforestation and such, so um, it really depends on how much we want to reduce uncertainty. Great, thank you. The next question is, how would terrestrial LIDAR be used to collect biomass data? Well. Um, what I've seen with terrestrial LIDAR is it's, it's still under the development phase, but it's, um, I think it's progressing fairly well. So basically, um, you would, you'd set up the, the LIDAR machine around a tree, and then you can get the, the volume data and um, convert that to biomass with wood density. Um, so we would need quite good wood density estimates and see how that varies within a tree. But um, the main problem would be that um, assuming that, well, I guess, so there are two problems. Probably that um, they couldn't um, detect the hollow sections, but also um, if, the, if the surface fitting isn't accurate, it'd be good if you could, uh, if the model could somehow know that, or at least you could, you could tell somehow and then el eliminate that data from the database. So 
it's quite an experimental and new technology, but I think it definitely has a lot of potential to get a lot more big trees and just a lot more biomass data in general. Great. And our next question comes from Irvin, and Irvin says, sorry, I haven't read your paper, so perhaps this is explained <laughs> in the paper, but uh, Irvin says, but from my experience, measuring the crown dimension in the field is more difficult and inaccurate than measuring total height. What do you think? Um, yes, measuring crown dimensions is quite difficult. The thing is, is that generally they're, um, they're very large, um, so you can get an idea, and which is quite important. I used four, four, um, four measurements, so radius in, in four directions and averaged them. And, um, and the, the problem is there's really no way to um, test it, whereas with, with height, you can you can cut down the tree and measure how well your instrument worked, but with crown width you can't really do that because it changes. Um, but I would say that that lots of lots of people, lots of guys who uh, are real jungle men, they're they're pretty good at, at finding where the branches go. So but yes, that that, it, that is a fair point. But I would say that um, it gives you quite a, a good idea, and it's still very useful information. Thank you. So the next question comes from John O. And John O asks, one question could be how important are big trees, larger than 90 centimeters, in terms of total biomass in the region? Are they 5% of biomass, 20%, 50%? Um, OK. <laughs> this is a good question also. Um, lots of people say that, that large trees aren't, aren't quite that important in, um, well, I guess, I would say until about a few years ago, lots of people thought that large trees weren't very important um, and they don't really exist anymore. In the concession where I was, I was always you know, on the lookout for large trees and I couldn't walk 100 meters without running into a gigantic one. So where I was, it was quite important. I can't give you a percent of total biomass, but I can give examples of like my, my largest dipteryx. It weighed 76 tons in itself. and um, forest biomass estimates in that region are about 226. So it's a really giant portion of forest biomass just in that area. And I think it's quite important to get the estimates of large trees right so that we know how, how degradation and selecting forest biomass. Thank you. So the next question is, did you use wood density from the Global Wood Density Database? Oh yeah, thank you for asking that question. I, um, I did. I, I used that only as, uh, um, only to guide my methods. Then I collected my own wood density data from each tree and even at multiple points along the tree. So what I input into my equations was my original data, not from the database. Great. Thanks for clarifying that. Our next question is from Nicola, and Nicola asks. Can you share your thoughts on the implications of moving from Tier 2 to Tier 3 carbon estimates, especially from the perspective of supposedly reducing uncertainties, which would depend on how well the local methods are developed? Is it really worth the effort? <laughs> um, I could. I have had this discussion many times. Um, and I can't, well, first of all, give the caveat, I don't actually know a whole lot of what Tier 2 estimates are. I've looked at Tier 1 and 3. So um, I would say, I, I mean, I can't say on a, on a whole level, all I can come up with is in that very small portion of the Amazon, it made one gigaton difference to use pantropical, I mean, sorry, the, the local model estimates. So I mean, I think it's quite useful, but if, if you know, the barrier to red is that we don't have um, local model estimates, then um, then th that's probably not worth it. You could go with the, the Guiana scene of, of this fixed amount of biomass, and that's it. Um, but I'd say if you really want to get the carbon right, um, the, the local models can make a big difference. And I think that my area was um, you know, sort of a perfect storm for having a big difference because they have large crowns, but, they have, but they're shorter. So the, the pantropical estimates really are quite perform quite poorly there, but um, I can't I can't really delve into that on every um, local 
uh, situation, but it's probably quite geography specific. Thank you. So the next question is, what is the prediction error of the model not including DBH, which is on the last slide, compared to the others in your study? Oh, the ones with um, height and crown area? I think so. I'll go back to the last slide. Yeah, I don't, I don't have those. Um, all the models, yeah, okay, so with this one, they are, <laughs> um, they're not great, I'll admit that. But they're definitely better, they're using um, height and crown area, or even just crown area, is way better than just using height. I'll say that much, I don't, I don't remember the exact, uh, what the prediction error is. They aren't, they aren't perfect, I'll, I'll say that much though. Or anywhere near perfect. <laughs> I like that honesty. Um, <laughs> So the next question is, do you have any thoughts on below ground biomass estimation? Um, I have lots of thoughts. Um, <laughs> I wish people would publish data if they had it. Uh, I, I wanted to do below ground biomass but because I think it's very important and we need to understand what's going on down there. It was just far beyond the scope of uh, a PhD thesis to excavate any number of trees. Um, so it's it's definitely a, a totally unexplored field and if anybody wants to collect more data I, I recommend it and to publish it, make it available. So the next question is from Hamad and Hamad asks, these days we can see in global database allometric equations of major tree species and those are readily available but not of less important tree species. Um, we're losing tree diversity and biomass. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, as far as what capturing the importance of, of less common species? Yes, um, I think sure, if you can speak to that. Um, yes, I would, well, I would say in the tropics it's, it's pretty impossible to, you could never create um, a single species model for every um, for every species in the tropics um, and, and you know that's probably what drives the um, single species models for the most common and commercially valuable ones. Um, I do think biodiversity is very important that, um, that um, mixed species models could capture that. So that leads very nicely in, into our... Can't really go. <laughs> This leads into the next question from Frederick, and Frederick asks, what is your impression about single species models? Could they be useful, say, for the for future RED MRV work? Oh, um, uh, maybe if you have a plantation. I, I, I personally can't see how um, single species, maybe uh, that we could ever have enough models or that even the, the processing of that data if you have if you had to put in a different equation for every you know 200 species per hectare or something I can't really see that being a practical option and going back to Nikoa's question of how how much is it I certainly I can't imagine that being worth it well great thank you do you Rosa do you have any other final concluding comments. We've come to the end of our time, so I'm going to move us over here to our final few slides. And there were a few questions that we didn't get to answer, but um, perhaps people can uh, read Rosa's paper or um, perhaps follow up with Rosa or find some other resources that she recommends and get additional information on this topic. So Rosa, any final parting words? Um, that's great. This is um this is my analysis of of, uh, of, of tree uh, allometric equations, so um, I hope I haven't offended anybody or, or left things unanswered, but uh, I hope it helps. That's, that's all. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you again. Thanks to everyone who joined us today. Thank you to Rosa for the presentation. As always, you can stay connected with us on the WWF side of things here on Twitter, on web, or on email, so please feel free to use those resources again.
The recording will be up on our YouTube channel within two business days, as well a copy of this presentation in case you'd like to refer to any of the equations or information that was in the presentation today. And with that, I will say goodbye to everyone. Thanks again, and we will see you at our next learning session. Bye.